Episode 350, The Beatty House. Dolls, the manager of the Lucky Cafe, had hired someone to poison a guest at his competitor's store, which nearly caused the man's death. As soon as this news was reported, it spread throughout Arkland City like wildfire. There was quite a lot to talk about it. In particular, colleagues in the catering industry deeply despised the notion. There was an unwritten rule in the catering industry. Fair and friendly competition was always welcomed, but behind the scenes and under the table dealings were intolerable. Dolls had used an especially sinister trick. Poisoning was not only unusual, but also dangerous and cruel. This made him especially despised by his peers. Under the lofty pressure of public opinion, Lucky Cafe had to dismiss its entire staff and shut down. But matter how much the police investigated, there was no trace of dolls. Dolls seemed to have disappeared from Arkland City entirely. The historic district has a high-end community with a great deal of luxury housing scattered about it. The villas in this community were densely covered with greens, which made it feel like spring no matter what the season. Located in the east of a three-story villa, the owner of this particular villa, Beatty, the real estate tycoon, was reclining on a chair in the courtyard, basking leisurely in the sun. After a few days of rest, he had completely recovered from the poisoning incident. Next to Beatty, a middle-aged assistant was reporting on what had happened in the company recently while Beatty was resting at home. I see. Beatty waved his hand and said faintly, Go down and call the housekeeper, please. The assistant nodded and turned into the hall to summon an old man with a constant frown. The old man's face was withered and thin. His figure was rickety, and he looked frail and underfed. If you only changed him out of his fine suit, he would resemble a farmer who had been beaten down by years of backbreaking work. He was a homely man, but he was the man whom Beatty trusted most. He was also his bodyguard. In the past few decades, the housekeeper didn't know how many difficult things he had handled and how much dirty work he had done for Beatty. There was a saying in certain circles that Beatty's housekeeper could take on the power of an entire army. That housekeeper, named Lorne, came to Beatty and stood respectfully. Beatty took a sip of coffee, blowing the hot steam off the top of it. How is Joe? Joanna was Beatty's wife's full name. They had been married for more than 20 years, and both of them called each other by their nicknames, which showed their deep affection for one another. Madam has taken some painkillers and has gone to sleep. Beatty frowned and sadness flashed in his eyes. His wife had been diagnosed with a strange disease many years ago. No matter what tests they ran or medicines they tried, doctors could not find out the cause. Even the Arkland City miracle worker was helpless to save her. Over the years, his wife had been constantly suffering from this strange disease and was becoming thinner and thinner. Watching his wife's health decline day by day, Beatty felt powerless. If his enormous, highly profitable real estate empire couldn't help the people who were closest to him when they were sick, what's the use of so much money? How are things going abroad? The housekeeper took out his tablet computer and reported. The private plane has been arranged. After the route is approved, you can fly to Regan with your wife. The hospital has also been in contact with... Beatty reached out and interrupted the housekeeper. No, it's okay. I'm at ease when you handle my affairs. Still, there was a flash of worry in his eyes. If he had any other option, he would not have wanted to take his wife abroad for medical treatment. After a long time, Beatty sighed and asked one more thing. And what of the security guard that poisoned me? The boy has been arrested and he's going to jail. The housekeeper leaned down slightly and said discretionarily, If necessary, I can arrange for his sentence to be maximized or even... Beatty shook his head and sighed. He is not the mastermind. What's the use of keeping up with him? And on that note, what of the cafe manager who gave the order? The housekeeper shook his head. In the wind. Beatty stopped talking, and no one could guess a trace of his thoughts from his ever still face. He's run away. Beatty tapped his fingers on the edge of his chair and murmured, Run away. Then what am I to do? I've lived a whole life and yet it all was almost cut short by a man who has now disappeared. The housekeeper trembled and bowed his head. I understand, he said. He turned to the side and dialed the phone number. At night, Arkland City was like an enormous dog, curled up and sleeping on the edge of the Arklands Bay. As a major capital city, there were countless people living colorful days in the city every day. Almost everyone was pretending to be something they were not in one way or another. Some masks that people wore were superficial, 
and some were life-altering. Big Brother was a security and defense company whose name was taken straight from 1984. This company was located in the east of the business district, close to the developed portion of the historic district. Almost half of the businesses located in the business district used Big Brother security guards. Because of their reliable security strength and good character, they were the top security company in the city. Late at night, the lights of the Big Brother building, from the first floor to the top 33rd floor, were all turned off, indicating that the employees were off work. But what nobody knew was that there was a party going on beneath the first floor. If one were to take the company's internal elevator directly to the 11th basement level, you would come to an enormous conference hall converted into an event space. The club was full of colorful lights. It had a dance floor and a karaoke machine. In the clubhouse, nearly a thousand employees of Big Brother, who were still dressed in their nice clothing from the workday, all took off their suits and ties and changed into vests and t-shirts and shorts. They turned into wild animals on the dance floor. Alcohol mixed with the smell of sweat added to the atmosphere. In a corner of the club, a group of big men with big gold chains were fighting for wine excitedly. Near this crowd, a young man with glasses and a laid-back style was the only one not clamoring for the attention of a hostess. He wore a silver ring on the middle finger of his left hand. He was deep in thought, rubbing the ring on his hand absent-mindedly. Although he was clearly the most tender of all the people present, none of the big men dared to bother him. This was because everyone else was actually rather intimidated by him, in spite of his humble appearance. This was for good reason, however. It was because this man was the CEO of Big Brother himself, Gordon Lay. Few people outside the company knew that the boss of the huge Big Brother Corporation was such a young man in his early 20s. Ah, this is the life that everyone wants right here. For the boss to build an underground club just for us. Mr. Lay, I'd like to toast you and your genius. Every single one of those big men respectfully raised their glasses in honor of the man.